the waste from power plants is a big issue. We need to address that. But we need to address the 15,000 abandoned uranium mines that are across the country and provide resources for the communities that it has hurt. The reason, you know, for people not to pay attention to this or, you know, the secrecy behind it, it allows the federal government to just put more and more dollars into weapons um, development, you know, the research and development. And none of it would exist without our taxpayer dollars. So we just need people to say, hey, I don't I don't think we should be funding uranium mining around the Grand Canyon. That is the voice of Leona Morgan. Leona is an indigenous community organizer and activist who has been fighting nuclear colonialism for over a decade. In that soundbite, she is emphasizing the importance of not ignoring these issues. And in this conversation, you will hear Leona and I referencing a webinar that took place two nights ago. That webinar was hosted by Allison Gitlin of the Sierra Club Grand Canyon Chapter, which also featured Dr. Tommy Rock and Carletta Talusi. The subject of that webinar was uranium mining in the Grand Canyon region. And now, this podcast, which you're about to listen to, this was a chance for me to sit down and have a longer conversation with Leona. This conversation was absolutely eye-opening for me, or should I say ear-opening for me, because what I'm learning is it's not just about stopping new mines from being built, yet it's about cleaning up mines that were built before Leona or I were even born. There are people today living in these communities that are suffering the consequences of uranium contamination. And if more of a light can be shed on this issue, these conversations might reach the ears of our elected officials and so they could work with these communities to find solutions. Without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Leona Morgan. Hello, Leona. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Cracky. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. I will note I am coming to you from Mississippi, and there are some crazy thunderstorms. So I believe nature is talking and a, a test of my drive to make this interview happen. So hopefully we won't get cut off from power outage, but I will note we tried to start. We had a little um, storm action going on. So nature's talking. I want to talk about these important issues. I had watched the Sierra Club webinar a couple nights ago, and I believe that's going to go up. So hopefully people that weren't able to experience that a couple nights ago, we'll be able to see that and I can share that. I can post a link to that. But yeah, this is pretty much a new podcast to start to talk about some of these Grand Canyon things. Uh, so I am the host here, Crocky, and uh, my involvement at Grand Canyon started in 2016 when I started uh, doing seasonal work out there. And as time went on, I started to learn more and more and you start to realize, you know, some of these threats uh, to Grand Canyon, it just became a situation where I saw, you know, I could take some of my skills, my background being somebody who records music, knows how to edit sound, edit video and this kind of stuff, and um, could start to make these things to get out there. So, uh, Leona, introduce yourself and um, uh, let the listeners know why this stuff is personal to you and and. I know you're an expert on these things. I can see you've dedicated years of your life to this stuff. So um, let us know where you're coming from with this. Sure. I'll, I'll start off by introducing myself to identify myself to my, my relatives out there. Um, so I grew up in Fort Defiance, which is right on the state line of um, Arizona and New Mexico, and my family is from Northwestern New Mexico. So I consider myself, I guess, uh, I'm Diné, but in the modern day geography, I'm more New Mexican. And so I'm not actually, I'm actually not so familiar with all of the 
complexities of Grand Canyon. Um, I've been very fortunate to get more involved through Hall No. So Hall No is our was our campaign um, we launched um, a few years ago to bring awareness to the transport. Um, so our goals were to shut down Canyon Mine, now Pinyon Plain, Canyon Mine. And then also um, we talked a little bit about White Mesa Mill, you know, how do we kill the mill? And then our concern was the transport in between, which would go through many um, indigenous communities. During the during the tour, we all know did an educational tour. We started at the, the mill and we stopped in communities along the route, the hall route back to the mine. And we ended up at the Red Butte gathering. And around that time, we also were invited down into Havasupai, down into the canyon. And so, you know, we were we were super fortunate to be there for a few days, enjoy the waterfalls, you know, just to be a part of the community for a couple of days. I mean, not really, not really part of the community, but to experience the community and the hospitality. Um, And it was an interesting juxtapose between, you know, the tourists that were coming in and then the the indigenous um, community down there who really is, you know, the frontline community when it comes to any threats to the canyon, because as as Allison talked about in the in the in the web webinar, the you know the way the water works and how um, how complex it is really. And to me, one of the things that I learned when I was there is the waters that come out of the canyon and that you know these springs that are all over the place. Um, the Havasupai use these for ceremony, and so once upon a time, you know, I think they depended on this for all sustenance, but um, they there is plumbing and, you know, running water down in the canyon. Um, and we um, went to the waterfalls and I actually talked to one of the elders um, and she explained to me a little bit about um, some of the, 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 the importance of the spring and, and, and how their culture depends on it, how they're trying to carry on their traditional ways. And um, for me, as an indigenous person, I didn't grow up learning, you know, everything about my own culture or traditional ways. And that's something I'm learning as I go, I guess, when when I got involved in um, some of this uranium stuff, it was about 14 years now. So back in 2007, I, I got involved um, dealing, you know, with this with this issue of uranium, because uh, in 2006 and 2007, the price of uranium it, 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 it exploded. It went up very, it was very high. And so all these companies wanted to start mining again. And for me, this was like a new issue. I had just graduated from college. And the funny thing is I never heard about uranium growing up. I, I knew there, you know, some of my family members had cancer. One of my grandmothers died of lung cancer. Um, I knew there were a lot of health problems in some of the communities, especially where my parents are from, because they both grew up in in communities around Crown Point, Crown Point, New Mexico. And um, in high school, I went to Gallup High, which is only a a very short drive from Church Rock, Um, but not until the end of my college years, I started to hear more about uranium and some of the issues and then after I graduated was when I really um, learned how the history of the mining industry really hurt our people. You know, some of the um, the issues with the companies not informing the workers about the possible health effects or the contamination to the environment. Um, so one of the biggest things I was surprised about was this um, Church Rock spill. So in 1979, there was the world's largest uranium spill in Church Rock. Well, technically north of Church Rock, New Mexico, um, near the Redwater Pond Road community. And this was, you know, the biggest spill in the world of uranium, but nobody's heard of it. And so I, I thought, why didn't I hear about it? You know, I grew up really close to it. I went to Gallup. We're just downstream. I, you know, until much later, I started to understand what was the nuclear industry. So my experience learning about uranium mining, um, it really came from one of my mentors um, who's passed away now. His name is Robert Tohey. 
And he actually worked for the Sierra Club. He was um, he worked in the environmental justice program of the Sierra Club in Flagstaff. And then whatever happened to the funding and all of the internal bureaucracy of the Sierra Club, um, I can't speak to that firsthand, but eventually he ended up working on um, uh, fracking around Chaco Canyon. Um, but when he was working as an EJ coordinator, he devoted a lot of time and energy to work with me directly to stop a mine. And we, we met each other when I was in college in 2003, um, because I was in, in, the, uh, in, in college at, here in Albuquerque at UNM. I went to school um, not really knowing much about like the political history of, you know, the not even like the American Indian movement. I didn't know much about all of the the, the history that was um, part of not just UNM, but in general. And so through this organization called the Kiva Club, I, I helped to get the Kiva Club restarted after uh, a, a couple of years of dormancy. And Robert Tohe came, um, it, he somehow just, he learned about our reopening. Um, Robert came to Albuquerque and he helped us to organize the Larry Casus Memorial event. This was in 2003. And that really um, brought some of the history back to Kiva Club firsthand from Robert, who was in the Kiva Club back in the 70s. And so, and he was doing like what you're doing. He was into broadcasting and radio. And back then it was, it was a big thing to have media. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, even some of the stories my parents tell me about, oh, there used to be just one radio station. Oh, back in the day, FM was a big deal, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so now we have, everybody has yeah. access to these things. And Robert was um, the person who got me involved in this uranium stuff. He called me one day and he invited me to a meeting here in Albuquerque where all of the Pueblo governors, the indigenous nations here in New Mexico, they have an organization called the All Pueblo Council of Governors, which is made up of all the governors of all the Pueblos, um, and back then, this I believe this was in May 2007, they were voting on a resolution um, to oppose, to formally oppose any new uranium developments on Mount Taylor. And Mount Taylor is, is our sacred mountain to the south as Diné people. And it's also a sacred mountain to, to many nations. Um, and since then has been classified as a um, traditional cultural property. So it is today a TCP and um, part of even, even to get that designation was, it became very politicized because of uranium. And so for me, you know, going into the canyon and learning about all the issues there, I connect it to my, my own um, connection to, I, I call it my mountain because I drive by it, I see it from Albuquerque, um, but Tzotzif is our sacred mountain to the south. And this is one place uranium was mined as well as other sacred places like the Black Hills, of course, Grand Canyon is what we're talking about, and, and other places in the world um, where indigenous people live have been mined. And so mostly like in the whole world, these stories, they're very similar. Like when Carletta was talking about the imbalance um, that's created when uranium is mined, I've heard similar stories from different nations about how when you disrupt the uranium, it it does cause these global changes in you know this balance and can can result in changes in weather and and it just it's very disruptive. Um, so yeah, when when Robert invited me to this meeting and I first learned about uranium and then that connection to cancer, um, when I heard the people talking about the health effects, immediately I thought well, my grandma died of cancer and then my aunt had just um, been diagnosed with breast cancer. And then I had a lot of other uncles who died already, passed away from cancer. And so I just kind of put all of that together and I was, I, I'm convinced that all of those cancers were caused by uranium um, impacts, either contamination to water or food sources. And then also um, inhaling um, particles that, Wow. you know, from the dust. So yeah, that's how yeah. I got involved in. With Robert's help, we successfully stopped that new mine. It was, um, it was being proposed near, near Church Rock. Yeah. Awesome. A couple, a couple miles from the spill site. Um, there was a proposal to do what's called in-situ leach mining. 
So it's not like where they take the ore out of the ground. It's not like Canyon mine where they have this shaft. Um, it's a, ki a kind of mining where they just drill. It's kind of, it, it's not fracking. People compare it to fracking, yeah, but it's this idea that you just take, use the water to mine. That's where I'll be kind of the naive host. Cause I know you have a little more, more knowledge about that, but yeah, even the concept of, you know, I almost picture like in a cartoon or, or something of somebody chiseling away into some a rock wall to create a mine. But yeah, there's all these different types. And and yeah, the way they're mining it, I mean, that's going to have a huge effect on how it spreads. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, so the mining that involves extracting the ore is, con it's, it's called conventional mining. Um, so you can dig a hole in the ground, or like you said, you know, chip away at a rock, um, go into a rock, like horizontally, um, you can do mountaintop removal. Um, so we have just 45 miles from where I'm sitting, the world's largest open pit uranium mine. Um, that was mined in the past and is still a huge wow. issue. But, um, what this is, this is New Mexico. Yeah, it's in Laguna. Um, it's near a, a little tiny village called Powati. So this is a village that um, is like, like you look out the window and then you just see these big holes and and um, the dust. It still blows in radioactive dust into people's homes today. And so, um, so these stories that people talk about, even though the mining stopped, mostly in the like late seventies, eighties here in this region, in my region, in New Mexico. Of course, there's mining in different states. Um, there's no mining in New Mexico, but the, the mining, it's still impacting us today. There's still contaminated water. There's still, you know, dust in some places that hasn't been properly contained. Um, and then in some places, there's still open exploratory drilling so, so there's a story I heard from a young woman who lives um, near Haystack, New Mexico, and 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 she's um, she said they have horses, but they can't gallop their horses because there's so many holes in the ground mm. that were just left open. So, so they worry if the horse's foot would get into one of those holes, and then mm. you know that would be very bad for the horse, and of course for whoever's on it. Leona, I know. Um... Uh, I've seen you call this nuclear colonialism. Yeah, I so I didn't come up with that um, term. Nuclear colonialism is something um, I think it was coined and really really popularized by uh, Winona LaDuke and others. So I I do have a definition that I use, which which is a uh, uh, put together from a couple of sources. Um, so yeah, today I'll talk with you about a lot of examples of nuclear colonialism, which is a form of environmental racism. And so this is the definition that I, that I usually share with people. Nuclear colonialism is the systematic dispossession of indigenous lands, exploitation of cultural resources, and the subjugation and oppression of indigenous peoples to further nuclear production of energy and proliferation of weapons from uranium mining, uranium processing, weapons testing, and waste storage, resulting in the destruction of indigenous peoples, cultures, and creation of national sacrifice zones. So ultimately, ongoing colonialism, like genocide and relocation, which people consider as history, as part of you know, the founding of this country, is still happening today. So people are, we're still, you know, putting people in situations where our genetics are being impacted, people are dying. And then in some cases where the land is so contaminated, the federal government is actually paying for people to move out of these places, which is not okay. For indigenous peoples, we don't, you know, moving is not an option, but when our land and water is so contaminated, I don't, you know, have, I don't ever hold anything against people who have to move for the safety of their children and, you know, for their lives. But um, to continue this is 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 not history. It's it's happening today, and people just don't see it. Um, mostly because radiation is not you know you can't sense it with your eyes or your human body. You need like a Geiger counter. But it's happening, and it's not just here in the Southwest. It's all over the world. Um, 
Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of stories, and then there's a, a, a I've heard many, many horror stories about, you know, companies that abandoned the mines and and just left their facility intact um, without decommissioning properly, and then, you know, different people going in there to take home tools or or building supplies or gravel, and and you know, so many horror stories about even someone building their hogan with uh, some of the wood and. Um, you know, paving their their little driveway with some of the rocks. And so, of course, um, I say horror stories because I'm not going to go into the details of what happened to their 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 families and their kids and, you know, some families losing several um, members because of the the, the the different health effects that happened later. Um, because this no, nobody knew, you know, nobody there was no sign that said, you know, this. Uh, don't, don't take anything from here. It could kill you in 20 years or, you know, cause miscarriages or. Yeah. That, that side of it. Yeah. Is, I mean, it's for lack of a better word. I mean, it's really messed up. I mean, when I learn about this history and, and, um, you know, of, yeah, it's a mix, I think of in the 1950s. Cause my, um, my dad's dad died of cancer at age 32, right after world war two. And so we have to think it had something to do with, you know, all that military stuff, right? He comes back from World War II. My father is born, but he dies right after at age 32. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just sharing that, you know, to show you um, these things in my own personal life and, you know, to help relate. Like, I have a lot of empathy for the things you're talking about Yet I can't even imagine, you know, that situation of it like happening right at your home and then there, yeah, there being nobody, nobody cleaning that up, you know, like one thing just to come in and mind this, another thing to not do proper cleanup and then a whole other thing to not even create that signage and, um, yeah, raise that awareness. So I, I really, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see like how you were drawn to this when you talk about your own background and, you know, the passion that's going into this and everything. And, um, it sounds like you've had some victories in getting mine stopped. What do you think? Cause I know you've done a number of interviews, you've done a number of lectures, you know, very great things you've done. You've ded dedicated, you know, more than a decade of your life to researching this kind of stuff. Um, so that I don't ask the same questions over and over, you know, I'm curious, just, you know, what do you think is some of the important action that would really be helpful, you know, in this time right now, moving forward? Well, yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if we can take a snapshot into, you know, like where I am you know, on a personal level, I think, um, I, I, I'd be happy to kind of explain what I think. Um, and again, this is for me as a, community organizer. Um, I never refer to myself as an expert because I, I, I have an art degree. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I, I don't have a, mm -hmm. a ge geology or engineering degree. I, I am somebody who focuses mostly on um, community education as well, you know, through popular education methods, doing a lot of webinars and, and, and before COVID, you know, doing um, workshops and, and hands-on types of things, um, mostly to educate people, because I think once people are educated, um, it's common sense. Um, but uh, it's, you know, we don't want cancer. We don't want uh, radioactive water. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, but these things become very politicized. Um, and then also people get bought, like industry will buy off people the government will buy off people. And this is one of the biggest issues today. Um, so just uh, going back to ISL mining, so I'm gonna use this as my example for kind of what I think needs to happen. Um, so with, with, the, with the ISL um, mine project that, that we stopped, this was being touted as a so-called new technology. And, and the company that was trying to mine um, Hydro Resources Incorporated, um, they wanted to extract uranium through this solution mining method 
um, very near to the Churchrack spill site. And so, so what they were planning to do was to just create a bunch of um, injection wells and production wells. And so, but if you could imagine, you know, out in the desert, there's just, you know, a flat, flat land, dirt, you know, little, little plants, sagebrush, that kind of stuff. Um, and they just wanted to, to put in a bunch of um, pipes that would pierce the aquifer and the uranium is, you know, it's actually in the aquifer, but it doesn't go anywhere. The uranium is permanently stuck in place. And what they wanted to do was pump in um, a chemical, like very similar to baking soda, which would oxygenate the uranium. And then once the uranium, once uranium is changed in this way, you cannot change it back. So the uranium is no longer stuck on the rock. The uranium can, it can move around within the aquifer and then, and then they pump up as much water as they can to capture all of that now mobile uranium. So it was, it would use a lot of water and contaminate water in the process. And then they would take that, that uranium sludge, um, dry it out, reuse the water to do it again. And then whatever sludge they could get um, out of the aquifer, that would be um, their, you know, it's, it's got uranium in it. So they called it a pregnant lixivant. They would put that in can uh, barrels and then um, transport it to a processing facility that would further separate the uranium from all the other um, whatever else was in there just to isolate the uranium. And that would occur in, in Crown Point, New Mexico, New Mexico. So in Crown Point, New Mexico, they already had what they called a central processing plant. And for me, I had no idea what that meant because when you hear the word central, you think, oh, there's all these satellite things happening around it. And at that time, they only had one, one site where they already were fully licensed to do the ISL and then drive it to Crown Point. So back then in my mind, I thought, well, if they do it there, what's to stop them from doing it in other places? And then, you know, taking it to this so-called central processing plant. Um, so there, I was part of this group called Eastern Navajo Diné Against Uranium Mining. And so they had already done most of the work to educate the community back in the 90s. They did a lot of work to push for the law against uranium mining on Navajo Nation that was passed in 2005. So Indom was instrumental in, in really starting this fight. I just came in toward the end. Um, people were kind of burnt out and not really um, wanting to do a lot of organizing. But what happened is we, we were, the group Indom, they were pretty, pretty successful in, in almost killing this project. But what happened was one of our own elected officials thought this would be a good way for economic development. They thought they could bring jobs to these communities. But what I learned is when they do this process of ISL and the aquifer, um, I was asking, well, what permits do they need? And then I found out, okay, they need an aquifer exemption and then like an underground injection control and just, you know, different permits they need. But this one aquifer, aquifer exemption permit from EPA was really interesting to me because I said, okay, well, if we're going to fight this, when, when does that permit end? Maybe we can stop the renewal. So I was trying to find all these avenues, you know, these points of, um, in these, these places where points of intervention where we can stop it. And then somebody told me, well, once you get an aquifer exemption, you, you don't need to renew it. It's forever. And what that is, is it exempts that part of the aquifer from water laws. So different water like um, standards that would be, you know, just for the general health of the environment, as well as, you know, so, so people could eventually use it for drinking water. And um, I thought, why would we allow, why would EPA allow uh, a permit that lasts forever that's going to contaminate the water forever in the desert? So this was really um, this was really something for me to learn, and um, it, I, I think this is one of the worst worst forms of mining that can exist. I mean, with the conventional mining, of course that's bad. Of course that's that's a horrible method as well. But this underground um, type of mining, you really can't see where the groundwater 
is, is moving. So once they stop that pumping, um, the company, I was at the presentation where the company literally told our council, your water is already contaminated. Your aquifer is already contaminated, but we're here to help. We're going to go in there and we're going to take out all that yucky uranium and we're going to leave it cleaner than it was before. Um, so this is what they said to my people. And, um, and so what I found out is, well, when they stop pumping those chemicals, they're going to keep releasing uranium in the aquifer. And eventually all the groundwater is going to shift. And then it's just going to create this underground plume of uranium um, and arsenic and other things that, that would also become mobile. So, um, and you can't see it. Like I asked them, well, where, where's the boundary? So the boundary was basically under their private land, like straight down. And they were like, oh yeah, we'll make sure it stays within our property. So all of this, this was being touted as new technology, that it's cleaner and that it's safer. And this isn't like the past stuff. This is going to be a whole different thing and it's going to be better. This is what, this is what um, they were telling my people and some people bought it, but this is the same story we're hearing today. So, so fortunately, the Diné people are pretty united against uranium mining because of all of the, the horrible things that we've already lived through. Pretty much, I think every Diné person has a story and a relative who's been hurt by uranium. So we're pretty, as a nation, I think we're pretty solid that we're never going to let this happen to our people again. Um, but we still have like these loopholes of like the transportation, um, you know, we're fighting that um, the possible transport of uranium from Pinyon Plain Canyon Mine to White Mesa Mill goes right through our nation. And we have a law against um, transport, but we can't stop these things if it's not on within our jurisdiction. So these are these are things we still need to deal with um, and help out other nations and, and to continue to fight. Um, but today, what I'm hearing, so we stopped it in 2014. Um, around 2012, I went to my first um, anti-nuclear conference. Again, Robert Tohi, he took me to Washington, D.C., and we went to this gathering where I met people who live near power plants. And I started talking to people, mostly white folks, older white people who live near um, power plants in the East Coast, New England, um, a lot of people from affluent communities. Um, a completely different, um, different type of uh, fight. You know, for me, I was dealing with thinking about our sacred mountain, our, our 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 elders, our traditional ways, our stories. You know, our relatives that don't have running water, and you know, having contamination to their water, and they're you know all of these. This is these are the thoughts I was having coming from here, and then going over there, and they're talking about you know the grid or. Um, utility companies and and all of the subsidies from um, you know the federal government and this was a whole different language and a different world. But since then, I've learned a lot more about the nuclear industry and the the beginnings, you know, back to the Atomic Energy Commission and all of that, and how it was specifically designed by the federal government in secrecy and and to make all of these things, you know, to create a whole new language um, that they, they call it nuke speak. So, you know, like when you, when, when there's a horrible, huge disaster um, catastrophe, you know, people are dying and, you know, like Chernobyl or Fukushima, they call it an incident. You know, they, they, there's all these euphemisms. So it's, it's keeping it out of the public eye. For instance, when we look at the news, the media, I don't ever expect to see like, um, some of these stories on mainstream media. And, and so sometimes you would expect something like maybe NPR to have stories on this, but even NPR doesn't do a good job. And so these things, anything nuclear dealing with uranium and all of the health effects um, now with nuclear energy, um, a lot of all of the, the realities are suppressed. To me, I don't hear it in the mainstream news. But um, what I do hear in the mainstream news is how great it is. So like recently, Bill Gates is talking about this so-called new technology. And so again, it's kind of the same story that I heard learning about ISL mining, that they're talking about a same, the same kind of thing with different packaging. You know, it's new and shiny and it's supposed to be safer and solve all of our energy problems. So there are different types of new 
nuclear reactors. So they, there's SMNRs, small modular nuclear react, reactors, there's thorium reactors, um, different types of technology that ultimately is supposed to, the, the idea is it's gonna be better and, and safer, but it still creates radioactive waste. It's still super expensive and is not going to be the you know the thing that's going to save us from climate change. So this is what I'm. This is where I'm at now is trying to figure out the differences and, and learning more about these different types of reactors. And so as long as nuclear is being pushed out there, people like Carletta, you know Tommy, the the ones on the webinar, anyone living near uranium sites. You know, we're going to always be at at war with the nuclear industry. It doesn't matter if it's an old school reactor. All of them are getting old and need to shut down anyways. But um, this idea of new, new it's reactors. The, it's the sourcing, right? It doesn't matter how, yeah, the reactors, you know, at least I can understand that part of it. You're, you know, you're explaining a lot of technology that even that's new to me. But yeah, the way I'm perceiving it is, right, it's like they're rebranding it as it'll, it, you know, the reactor will run in a different way, but you still need to pull that out of the ground and that's gonna have consequences. And still they haven't even, you know, what you're telling me is they haven't even fixed the consequences from, you know, 1979, which, you know, e even that kind of stuff too, you talk about a lot of people haven't heard of that. And I, I like to sort of, you know, help be that voice of the outsider because I think, there are def there's a lot of activists in Flagstaff. There's a lot of activists in the Four Corners. But yeah, the question is, how do we get the people on the coasts to start to realize, you know, um, you mentioned, you showed a graphic in that webinar and you showed a lot of these nuclear power plants are on these coastal cities and these places. And so it's being extracted from the Four Corners, but the Four Corners isn't benefiting from it. They're not having green power plants in the four corners, right? It's pulled from there, the waste is there, and then these power plants are in different places. Well, well yeah, and so um, part of the issue is uh, if, if there will be new mining, we already know, we talked about that enough today and everybody who knows about uranium mining, this you know, new uranium mining is, is, is not the way to go, um, no matter which way it's done, if it's uh, conventional or ISL or you know, uranium mining should not be taken out of the ground. Um, I mean, uranium should not be taken out of the ground. And um, these other reactors, they're talking about, you know, like reprocessing fuel, like spent, like already, already used fuel, like fuel that's already been through a reactor and somehow um, using that. So, so people think that, oh, well, we're not going to take more uranium out of the ground. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to reorganize the fuel, um, that is that was used or weapons. We're gonna, you know, there's there's all this, there's a lot of ideas people have, but the 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 bottom line is when these things happen, when you're reprocessing, which we don't do in the US, and that's something that's a new threat, um, especially here in New Mexico, um, because we're fighting Holtec. Holtec is is trying to build this this huge waste storage for waste from all the power plants. And, and there's talk of reprocessing, but these other types of reactors that will either use like weapons and down blend the uranium or whatever, there's different things that need to happen that will all eventually result in radioactive waste. So it's, it's making more waste. That's the problem. Um, uranium mining this, the, is, 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 is one of my greatest concern, um, but the waste that already exists there is nowhere to put it. There's no permanent disposal. Um, and that's why they're saying storage. So this is something new I learned is, is just those two words, disposal and storage. So right now, um, there's no disposal place for waste from power plants. They were saying Yucca Mountain, but that's failed. That's never going to open. So the idea is to store it in New Mexico for maybe 100 years until the United States or, or the industry or, you know, whoever comes up with some permanent place. What we're saying, the people who are fighting these things, we have a national coalition and we're saying this needs to be community-based and that communities 
need to be at the table from the beginning to the end. Like we, we need it, like the, the communities that will be impacted. So communities that live around reactors, communities that live around waste sites yeah. or, or processing sites, they should have a say yeah. in what is allowed there. But um, as for now, if any waste is moved to New Mexico, we don't think it's going to be storage forever. If anything comes here, it's, it, it could become permanent disposal. And then we'll be, you know, again, the national sacrifice zone for the nuclear industry. And that's one of my, that's, that's not just impacting, like the location is in the Southeast corner of New Mexico, but the transportation is impacting the entire country because the waste would have to travel through, you know, most of the country to get here. And if it was really going to be storage and temporary, when they find the permanent place, then the waste would be moved again a second time. So, so these these um, these are not real solutions. And and so right now, before people start coming up with all these new ideas of, oh yeah, we're going to do this and you know, new technology. I mean, first let's go back to the beginning and take care of the mess that was created before any of this. So, the waste from power plants is a big issue. We need to address that. But we need to address the 15,000 abandoned uranium mines that are across the country and provide resources for the communities that it has hurt. So like RECA, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, that um, is, is scheduled to sunset next year. So this is the federal law that gives compensation to um, miners and workers and, and people have been working more than a decade to expand RECA, not just to expand um, the timeline so it'll it'll be available past 2022, but also to expand who it covers, including downwinders from the Trinity test. So the nuclear, the first nuclear weapon that was ever exploded was here in New Mexico. And those people that lived downwind from Trinity. Was, uh, white, was that White Sands? It was, it was in the White Sands area, yeah. Whoa. So yeah. In, in, in New Mexico, um, the bomb that went off, it was on July 16th, 1945. And the people... Um, that are impacted from that today, you know, again, cancer and a lot of folks um, having uh, miscarriages and, and, and bad things happening to their animals and you know, plants. And um, they were never included in RECA, so they were never compensated. Um, so they, you know, we want to, RECA should include them. And then also downwinders um, from uranium mine sites and then other nuclear testing sites. So not all US nuclear testing sites are included in RECA. Not all people impacted by the United States defense program are included in RECA. Just, you know, certain individuals and then, you know, having the paperwork and all of that, that whole process is, has been very difficult for people because they don't have, some people didn't have proof of working in the mines. And so, and like, even I'm, I'm going to give it an example, like my parents didn't even have birth certificates until, um, you know, much later in their life, like people were born in Hogan's and, you know, they didn't really have bank accounts. And so things like that, you know, just proving, you know, having the paperwork to prove they were minors and, you know, they, they should be compensated. Um, that's just one hurdle, but there are there. It is moving forward um, to to have um, um, amendments to RECA. This is something that's been ongoing in Congress, and and hopefully, you know, this is something people can. Um, if your listeners, I don't know if it's appropriate to give calls to action on your sure. podcast. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But yes. So this is these are things that need that your Congress people need to hear. Everybody, if any. I, it's not a hard thing to call your representative. It's not like you're going to talk to your senator or your congressperson. If you're lucky, you might talk to a staff person. Most of the time, you can just call. There's a switchboard. You can Google, you know, how to get a hold of my congressional official, whoever, senator or representative. And and most of the time, you just leave a voicemail. And it would be very good for people to call in. And even if you don't know the science, people don't need to know the details. But the important thing is to express that concern to your federal, uh, federally elected um, officials to say, you know, I heard about this new nuclear stuff that Bill Gates is talking about, and it's not a good idea. You know, don't don't fund it because nuclear anything cannot exist without federal funding. But the reason, you know, for people not 
to pay attention to this or, you know, the secrecy behind it, it allows the federal government to just put more and more dollars into weapons um, development, you know, the research and development. And none of it would exist without our taxpayer dollars. So we just need people to say, hey, I don't I don't think we should be funding uranium mining around the Grand Canyon, but fund cleanup. Let's fund, fund the cleanup. cleanup. Let's, yeah. let's put money toward cleanup because there's no federal there's no federal law saying to clean up these abandoned uranium mines. So that would be another easy thing. You know, hey, yeah. we should clean up the mines or expand. Well, that's, that's so important. Um, yeah, it's so important to to put that out there that, yeah, it has to happen sort of on a government level. Like we've got to reach out um, to get that funding to do this because, you know, in my time uh, working at the South Rim of Grand Canyon, I had a great manager and I'll give her a shout out, Rami Murphy was a woman who set up a lot of trash pickups. And in my time with other coworkers in our days off, we did hundreds of hours of trash pickups at Grand Canyon. But if somebody called me up and said, hey, Crocky, do you want to go to Red Butte and clean up uranium? I would, there would be a little hesitation there. <laughs> you know, like I can't just go and volunteer to go clean up uranium. Like it has to happen on a large scale. There has to be funding for it. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And absolutely, yeah, we can use this podcast to put that word out there because, yeah, like I'm, I'm not a politician myself. I'm not, in, I'm not, I don't know if I would get into politics. That stuff kind of stresses me out a bit. Um, but I think anybody who does get into politics is doing that to help make the world a better place. And hopefully, I'm, maybe I'm vocalizing that as a reminder that I think that's what politics should be about, is trying to make the world a better place for everybody. And yeah, that, I, I, I just want to hammer that down. What you're saying is that it needs to be a federal funding. It needs to be federally driven that they are funding this cleanup and doing that. Because yeah, when you talk about a private person like Bill Gates is advocating that, you know, nuclear could be good. Well, he's a private person. He's got his own company. He's, you know, risen to billions of dollars from that. And, and, and even that too is something I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, this is all stuff I'm, I'm learning the inner workings and how complex it is and how difficult it is. You talk about jumping over, over hurdles, but I hear this kind of stuff and you think, you know, there are people out there, there are, philanthropists and these billionaires, you know, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, if, yeah, if these people too, if the, if this podcast or if somebody heard this and picked it up on a news outlet and if these stories, you know, just got going and got more light was shed on this, I feel like that's, that sounds like the direction, yeah, that um, it needs to go is that, yeah, there needs to be some kind of group, some kind of funding, ideally from the government to, um, you know, not only RECA compensating and um, trying to make things right, but also, you know, get on it, put put some funding there. Yeah, I, right now there's no program that exists for um, the federal government to clean up mines outside of the, the current um, process where they uh, try to get money from the companies that are so-called responsible parties. So they call them PRPs, you know, they're potentially responsible parties. So like, for example, in the Church Rock area, I talked about some of the cleanup that's going on that they wanna scrape up the waste from the mine and then put it on top of the mill site. This, the company was called United Nuclear Corporation and it's currently owned by GE. I mean, I would imagine GE has the money to do a better job, but, um, this is, you know, one of the companies that still exists, whereas a lot of companies, they just went bankrupt and they don't exist anymore. It's, it's one thing when companies change names and, you know, they're like Pinyon Plain is, you know, this whole idea of changing the name. Um, that's, that's, that's a whole nother thing, you know, to have, you know, to hide themselves. But when the company is no longer around at all and the federal government is like, oh, well, we can't get money from that company because they don't exist. That's unacceptable. They need to, they are the responsible party. The federal government is the responsible party and, and they should involve community 
people who are the most impacted to, you know, create the standards that are acceptable to us for cleanup because they make their own standards. The companies can kind of like, um, apply for alternate concentration levels. So if, if a company can't clean up to a certain level, they can just, you know, apply to clean up to a different level. And then eventually, you know, they don't have to clean up to the pre-mining sta- um, standards or the pre-mining levels of, of radi- radiation. And then it's, it's in some places, it's really not possible to put everything back the way it was. In some cases, if you had the money of those three men you named, just imagine if Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk <laughs> all put together this, you know, cleanup uh, account, this this money. I mean, they would never do it. But I imagine... Never imagine say that, never. never yeah. Well, I mean, Hopefully. it's not... <laughs> or we're calling them out. We're calling them out here. Uh, if, 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 if it's not going to profit them, you know, right, if, there's, yeah. if there's no way for them to profit off of it, I doubt they're going to do it. Cause I mean, they're, they're going to other countries and, you know, causing problems in other countries when this country, you know, has a lot of problems that need to be addressed. Um, and we don't want them causing more problems. Cause I feel like when you have, um, men with a lot of money, that can be powerful, especially in a, in a society that is still very patriarchal. And, and like right now, um, I don't think people, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not happy with the last administration at all in any way, but I think something that was beneficial was to expose how much white supremacy is here in this country and, and the reality of, of how powerful that can be. Because a lot of people, think like, oh yeah, I, I hear people say, I don't see color. You know, I don't, that's, that's the most ridiculous way to deal with racism is to say something like that. I mean, we have so many issues when it comes to racism and sexism and classism and all of these, these existing problems. And, and the, the ones who are the most oppressed, um, we're the ones that are just, you know, getting more, um, of the burden of, in this case, radioactive waste. And so I don't know if, you know, if anyone um, knows any of these three men and they wanted to (laughs) make a business out of it, I I would imagine it would be kind of scary because um, people in in positions of power that can exploit um, other people, you know, they, they, they might not do the best job. And that's why we need community people involved at every step of the process to protect workers to make sure, you know, who's, who is, like you said, you wouldn't go out and pick up uranium and clean it up, but this is what's happening in Japan. They're in Japan. Really? There's, yeah. F- from Fukushima. Fukushima. Because the government put out so much false information and the government is not coming out with the truth to their citizens and, and people are seeing past it. So, so people are getting their own Geiger counters, mm. their own, their own machinery to actually measure how much radiation is in their food. And so you have men in Fukushima, you know, cleaning, scraping up dirt in the playgrounds. So the kids can play, you know, the kids can't play. They have to keep their shoes on. They can't, you know, they can't eat the dirt. You know, they have, they have to be very careful with the children because people stayed in Fukushima and, and they're, there's their, they have to hose off the houses. They have to, you know, they have to constantly keep cleaning and, and it's not because the government is doing it or informing them. They're doing it themselves. And, and what do you do with all that trash and the decontamination um, stuff that they're using? This is, this is a whole nother problem that's happening in Fukushima. But because the government is not doing it, there's people literally out there, you know, taking it upon themselves, organizing, you know, organizing themselves you know, bringing in food from other regions, you know, so people can have clean food. It's a whole network of massive undertaking. And it's because people are smarter than to trust the government that says it's safe or, you know, so we we really need to educate ourselves on what is, you know, what is radiation and, you know, what is safe and what is not safe. I mean, we can't trust the industry or the government or, or Bill Gates, you know. 
That is, yeah, that is something that is powerful, I think, in this time in history is, you know, like you said, we have these new outlets where it used to just be one radio station. We have new outlets to spread the word. You know, I can't tell you how many times I go on YouTube just to look up how to do something. Like even, I think even for setting up this Zoom, I was like typing in how to schedule uh, a Zoom thing. But um, yeah, like, um, and and I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to be a little lighthearted because these are really heavy topics. So I'm just trying to find that balance of like, I, I want you to know I take this stuff serious, but I also have to balance my own energy by just trying to find a little humor in, in um, my own, um, just my own ability to start to learn this stuff. And uh, you're really opening my mind so much. And I hope other listeners, you know, are going to learn a lot from this. I think um, there's millions of people that visit the Southwest, you know, be it if they're going to Grand Canyon, if they're going to see Monument Valley, Antelope Canyon, there's millions and millions of people that go there. And so, um, you know, perhaps that is something, you know, I want to try to tap into is getting this word out to those tourists because they're coming anyway. They're learn they're researching how to do their Grand Canyon trip. They're trying to learn about these places, but this stuff isn't often talked about, right? Like you said, there's there's these powers that they want to promote nuclear. And so if people started to oppose it, it would create this divide or 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 a, um not a divide, but like a um a conflict of interest is probably the best way to put it for that. But yeah, everything you're saying, and I'm just I'm kind of rambling, talking, uh, talking out loud, but I, I'm trying to narrow in like how I, you know I can take stuff away from this and the important things. And so, yeah, I think it's like you said, it it you could try to reach out to these billionaire people, right? But there is an importance in grassroots, and and Tommy, uh, Tommy Rock talked about that, and Carletta, you know, they were talking about that the other night in Sierra Club, the importance of grassroots because. Yeah, if somebody that's not even there is setting these regulations and stuff and then coming in, you know, you need to you need to talk to the community before right, before you even start mining or before you would even set up a, a power plant or these kind of things. Like, yeah, I think I think that's so important and that's some something new that I'm learning just from talking to you is the importance of, you know, there need that 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 needs to be almost like um a stand, I mean, that needs to be a standard is that, yeah, the community needs to have full say before this stuff even begins. Right. And so like with Canyon Mine, um, all of us are concerned if energy fuels um, what, you know, if, if they're going to actually, they, they keep saying, oh, we're going to open, you know, we're going to open this year or we're going to, and this is a normal thing, I think, for uranium companies to do, to speculate, like when they're going to open, um, I don't think they will ever open, honestly. I don't think the uranium market is is there for them to make a profit, um, which is great. But if these, if if any kind of um, push for new nuclear power is to become a reality, um, everywhere is at threat. Um, this is uh, I know I know this is uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share some information that. Um, I know people don't really know about, but it's it's not really a problem today. But um, a few years ago, there was a proposal to build a new nuclear reactor uh, along the Green River, which is a tributary to the Colorado River. And so these power plants, um, you know, they need a lot of water to 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 cool the um, reactor and then also to store the waste. Um, after you know the fuel rods are kept in the cooling pools and they need a lot of water to keep cool so this idea of a new new nuclear reactor on green river i'm sure nobody knew about it but if the colorado were to become um, contaminated because green this is in utah um, to me that would be an issue uh obviously for anyone along the the, the colorado who lives there but i don't think um we would get attention as Diné people. I don't think indigenous peoples would be protected, but because Colorado River is exploited for water for you know Phoenix and LA and Las Vegas, then it becomes a concern. So, so some of the issues when these um, big um, industries happen 
uh, oftentimes rural communities, just, just because, you know, we have a lower population density, um, we're often just, you know, considered expendable, just like the storage um, proposal here in New Mexico. But um, once it becomes a threat to a large population, then people start to become concerned. And so this Green River project uh, never went forward, um, but it, there's a lot of I, there's a lot of proposals and there's a lot of um, um, I know uh, different companies uh, and then different utility companies are considering um, to to invest in nuclear and so it, it doesn't have to be you know in your backyard like you know Green River in Utah is is pretty far from the Grand Canyon but eventually you know because it's a, a tributary to the Colorado eventually you know people visiting you know, Grand Canyon, they would have no idea, you know, if there were radionuclides in the water. Um, and people don't really think about these things. Like in New Mexico, we're downstream from Los Alamos and the Rio Grande, you know, um, has been contaminated, you know, from activities at Los Alamos where they make weapons. And right now they're planning to expand and in the federal government is planning to put a lot of money into Los Alamos to build more um, plutonium pits, which are used in nuclear weapons. And, and the United Nations just, um, this treaty, I don't know if you know, if you're aware of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons um, has been ratified by enough countries that it actually, they say, you know, it entered into force in January of this year so according to international law, nuclear weapons are illegal, but mm. because the United States doesn't, you know, it's kind of an optional thing, I guess, for companies, if they, I mean, for countries, for the different nation states, for them to ratify it, it's up to that individual um, nation. So the United States, as, as far as in my foreseeable future, I don't see the United States ever ratifying this treaty of the UN and, you know, to give up its nuclear weapons, but the rest of the world has already enough countries have already ratified it. And so, I mean, it would be great um, if the, if, if, you know, the United Nations could hold the United States accountable um, to stop making nuclear weapons. I mean, that's, that's the other side of the uranium story is it's not just a energy thing. It's, they go hand in hand. Um, some of the byproducts, the waste from nuclear power plants go into, you know, they're the necessary ingredients into nuclear weapons. So you cannot separate nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. If we're going to stop one, we have to stop both. And that's why um, a lot of people fighting uranium mining believe by stopping uranium mining, you know, hopefully it'll stop both nuclear power development and more nuclear weapons development. Stop it at the source, yeah. Like the the phrase "nip it in the bud" is, uh, yeah. That's um, that's uh, important. I got thunder rolling outside. I don't know if that picked up on the microphone. <laughs> um, nature is speaking to us. It is time to make change in this world, build a better world for these future generations too. I think that's a big reason I, you know, have turned to making. Um, these videos and these podcasts kind of things because I'm getting older and I'm saying I'm not going to be around forever. And, you know, I want people, you know, kids that are just kids today, you know, when they grow up, I, I hope that they can have a cleaner and more beautiful world um, from these efforts. So, yeah, I can see, Leona, that you've really uh, done incredible work and um, a lot of stuff I learned too. I mean, I, I, I feel like, um, uh, you know, I, I knew about you and, and had seen some of your lectures and stuff that are online. I encourage people, you know, listening to uh, look up Leona Morgan. Uh, you'll find some great uh, material about some of these speeches you've made already. Um, but yeah, just learning about like your roots and, and how you kind of reignited um, this Kiva Club and, and all this kind of stuff is uh, really powerful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for um, taking the time to listen and, and share my story. And um, yeah, I really um, wanted to honor my mentor, um, especially, you know, the, since this is for the Sierra Club, Robert Tohey was uh, instrumental in shutting down that, 
that uranium project and um he he we lost him just over a year ago and you know he's very 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 much missed and was loved by, you know, by his family and everyone and so he in my life my person he's one of my personal heroes and mentors and i i don't think i would be here today if it wasn't for his guidance and and support and so that's another thing is we need a lot more support for young people you know doing this work i've been lucky to have support from a lot of different individuals but in the beginning i didn't really have support i didn't have um i i wasn't very well treated by some of my elders and i think that's another thing that um i'm really lucky now that i'm older i think um, that's my number one mission too is to bring in younger people and help to educate them in a good way and support them and we started an organization in albuquerque called nuclear issues study group and um honestly i'm still trying to figure that out because nuclear stuff is super technical and the laws are complex and it's not as sexy as like you know fighting fracking or <laughs> some of the other or you know right now there's a lot of i was just listening to biden's talk earlier and a lot of it's about immigration um, immigration policy and of course with black lives matters you know everybody everybody's jumping on board to to fight racism um but nuclear is not that interesting and so if anyone wants to get involved and <laughs> you you can look me up on facebook um i share most of my stuff on my personal facebook and let folks know uh like the cleanup at church rock this this horrible plan to put mine waste on top of mill waste in a flood zone in a flood plain where you know it could result in another church rock spill um, we'll be updating our Hall No website, hallno.com, um, and then I'll be posting stuff on on Facebook in the in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so it's not there yet, but there's talking points um, that we need to get out there for the Church Rock um, cleanup stuff. Um, there's an open comment period on other nuclear um, things happening in New Mexico. I'd love to talk more about that. I know we're running out of time now, but. I mentioned Los Alamos and then um, the waste isolation pilot plant. That's another waste dump uh, that wants to expand. And then, of course, the Holtec fight, which is only 13 miles north of WIP. I mean, these are we have tons of nuclear facilities in New Mexico, and they all seem to want to grow and live forever. And and they're not. I mean, it, we we need to stop them ourselves, and it will happen. But it's just it's it's been a long slow fight and we could use more help so yeah that's cool yeah i was gonna ask yeah how people could reach you and and get involved and uh it sounds like um yeah you've given those so yeah i'll i'll find the links for those uh no hall and and whatnot and i can put those links up uh oh yes. no <laughs> ah <laughs> i'm dyslexic i think um, no no it's, everyone <laughs> always, everyone says no hall hall no yeah, we, you know, do we okay. want mining in Grand Canyon? Hall no. Oh, I see it. I see do it. Do we want transport through the res? It's a play hall on words. No. Hall yeah. no. Oh, hall no. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Like, I like the, yeah, I, I like the fun in that too. Is, um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta have some fun while you're tackling these things. Cause like you said, it's, you're, you're often gonna find a lot of people you know, that you got to push against to make these things happen. But at the same time, you always got to know what you're doing is valuable. It's good. And as you, yeah, as you face that resistance, you, you just got to keep knowing what you're doing is really good. And so I hope, um, I know you realize that Leona, but, um, yeah, I just want to, um, reiterate that. And anyone who's listening that is, you know, making moves and activism and whatnot, it's, you know, it's always, positive it, it 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 you know to to put your energy there to make a better future um to wrap this up i know like yeah you you've you've brought up so many other side stories that i could talk to you for hours but i do value your time and it's you know you would always be welcome um to come back and do another one of these um anytime uh so yeah is there anything um last in closing any final notes um I, not really i think um you know i just want to honor the all the organizers and um community people and survivors um that have pretty much 
laid the groundwork for people like me um, moving forward. I mean, I I learned a lot from other people um, and people taking the time to to help me. And with the nuclear stuff, it I mean that that takes a lot of time to understand. So I just want to tell people, you know, it's it is complicated and it is it can be daunting, but it just takes time. And if you really want to understand it, there's people out there um, who are who might you know take the time to do it. I'm always willing to you know help folks and and just you can Facebook me. I I spend a lot of time talking to people one on one, and then it's always better in a group situation. But um, yeah, I just ask people to to share what they learn and to tell other people what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I think as long as we continue to talk about these things and put it out there, um, we can shut down Pinion Plain, Canyon Mine. We can shut down White Mesa Mill, um, which also is another thing I didn't get into with, with what they're trying to do and how they want to expand. Um, we can shut down energy fuels. You know, these things can happen. It just takes a group effort and working together. So, yeah. But thank you for the mm -hmm. podcast and um, what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, for coming on here. That was my conversation with Leona Morgan. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Like I said earlier, I hope you guys do share this and help get the word out. As Leona said, it is about people coming together, working as a group. I do want to stress um, what she talked about too, of it being, you know, a community thing that companies need to talk to these communities to to really talk about the solutions to these issues i encourage you guys also to check out hallno hallno.com look that up also uh, as leona said she posts a lot of these events these things on her facebook page uh, so you guys can join in these efforts and that'll do it for this episode see you guys next time Brand, can I TV.